Hello, everybody. How are you today? I'm Daniela Clapp. I'm the founder and CEO of Xperia Medical Education. For those who, know, who don't know us uh, still, um, we are the only accredited Netflix for doctors. So um, please join us today. I'm very glad because we have a very trending topic with telehealth success. Um, two years ago, um, when I reached out to Dr. Uh, Joshi um, about the need uh, for training in telehealth, uh, asking by doctors all the time, you now after the pandemic, proper training on this topic. So she helped us. Uh, we made a, an amazing course on Xperia, and I'm very happy that today she joined me uh, in this webinar, in this expert interview to get um, all her insights about uh, telehealth. So please join me on the stage, uh, Aditi. Hi, Hi Dr. Daniela. <laughs> how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm very fine. So for people in the audience who don't know you, if you can take a moment to present yourself, please. Yeah, so uh, I am an emergency medicine physician and um, I'm from the US, if you can't tell by my accent. And I graduated residency in 2009. And then in 2013, I started in telemedicine. I started out at a startup and I worked there for three years. I saw a lot of patients and we did a lot of setting the stage for what telemedicine is. And then in 2016, I moved on to a large academic center and was medical director there for five years where we tried almost every type of thing that you could. And we ran a lot of programs. We did a lot of national advocacy. And we really talked about operations, education as well, relevant to this topic. We ran a lot of education for medical students, residents, residents, other physicians, and also a fellowship. And then after leaving there, I've worked as a consultant in telemedicine and other digital health ventures too. It's not just telemedicine anymore since everything is very related. And I'm very happy to be here and talk about a subject that's very close to my heart. Yes, thank you for joining us. So we made, uh, first of all, a, a course two years ago, um, you and I and, and Xper, no? So uh, maybe we can have a, a quick presentation of this course because it's still a very relevant topic. Um, one of the most viewed course on Xper, and we have 350 courses, so yours is definitely top 10. Um, we see that uh, we have more than 5,000 views, no? videos uh, viewed of this uh, amazing course and 500 HCPs are uh, enrolled no. and what is also a great KPI that we watch on Xperia is the high completion rate we have on this course because people who start this course they finish this course because 85 percent of them are uh, completing the course so this course is very short. It's one hour. It's very practical. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joshi is really giving you practical tips uh, in these um, minutes of, uh, yes, one hour um, videos. And uh, it's accredited. So you can get an official certificate by the UEMS, the European Union of Medical Specialists. So it's valid in the US and in Europe and in most countries in the world. And uh, also we translated it. We have it in English. English, of course, but we also have it voiceover in uh, Spanish. So um, it's really easy and straightforward, but of course, um, take the course. But most importantly, and why we are here today is to talk uh, if you want to go deeper and really learn a lot about how to get um, to have success in telehealth. Um, Aditi is here to present our new initiative, uh, that uh, amazing book um, that uh, you, you wrote. Uh, tell us the story of this book. Yeah, so the idea was, uh, I wrote this book with Dr. Brandon Welch, who is the CEO of DoxyMe. The idea was that despite the fact that telemedicine has been around for much longer than just the pandemic, well, during the pandemic, a lot of people started using it. However, there wasn't any guidelines or idea of really how to make it successful. How do you, what do you prepare? What do you have to think about? How do you train your clinicians? What's important for patients? Uh, how do you finance it? All of these things are really important topics, but there wasn't really anything out there that taught that or spoke about it. And so the idea was, how do you actually, well, the idea behind the book and our idea was, how do you, what are the topics that people need to know about to make telehealth successful. And what I really love about it is that we talk about 
telemedicine, um, its history a lot. We have a lot of examples and everything is based in research. But a lot of the way that we went about this is going to be relevant for anybody who's trying to employ technology into their practices. It, it really is talking about new innovations and how do we think about it. Great, uh, a great way to become obviously an expert no, and to complete the short course we, we saw before. But um, it's very, it's, it's a lot of work, no, writing a book. So what was the inspiration behind it? What was the, the, the deep motivation you had when you decided to, wrote, uh, to write that, that book? Tell me. For me personally, I've accrued a lot of knowledge and experience. And a lot of it was in different places, or I would share it with people in very specific niche ways. For example, the XPeer course and the education portion was really only a small part of what I have done in telemedicine. It's a really important part, but it's really a small part. And so the, the whole idea for me was, what do I do with all this information that I have that I think is going to be very useful for people and very helpful for anybody trying to build this out? And putting this all down on paper was really important. It feels like just getting things that were in my brain, in my practice, and putting it down there so that now it's out there so people can use it. And also there were so many people that, you know, once we, we published this, that came out and said, this doesn't exist anywhere. I've been looking for something like this, whether I'm teaching or I run a practice or I work in the space. I haven't found anything like this which means that despite the fact that telemedicine has been around for a while and it's a trending topic, there still wasn't anything that people could take to as a guide. Right. And what are the key aspects um, in this book? So we, we uh, separated out into five big topics. So the first are patients, because patients are what we think of first. And you're really looking at how does it help patients? How does it improve their care? How does it improve access? How do they feel about it? What do you need to know about patients to be able to do this for them successfully? Second is clinicians. So not just um, you know thinking about what do physicians need or how do they practice, uh, but it's also how do organizations build out these practices thinking through what their actual workers and healthcare workers will need. And in this section, this is where we talk about the ways that clinicians practice telemedicine. And so the t parts of the course would be in this section. And then we look at the technology. How do you pick the technology? What's important? And so there's a lot of things that people don't realize, right? So if you're buying something and you're going to a vendor, and you know I see this a lot too, uh, when people will have a discussion when they're pitching, they may use the same word, but the same word does not mean the same to people in different uh, uh, different. Uh, specialties or different jobs. It doesn't always mean the same thing. So you really have to make sure that you're thinking through the right thing. And we really do a deep dive on some of the things that you need to know. You know, things as basic as what kind of camera and video you need to as much as how are you going to choose out of all of the different things out there, what kind of uh, specifications you need, what kind of expectations you can have. And then we talk about financing and not just how much does it cost and what are you going to and what reimbursement is, but how do you have to think through the different models and finances that are around the world? So, of course, this book was based in the U.S. Both of us worked in the U.S. Uh, most of the time for this. However, we do look at a couple of cases from around the world and their success with telemedicine and how they actually uh, took their specific types of healthcare models and were able to use it for telemedicine. Uh, specific ones that we did were Singapore, uh, the U.K., uh, Germany. Uh, and so we also, you know, put in examples from other places um, such as Japan and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Chile in examples from there, because it's important to look and see how other people are doing it. Yes, and then yes. lastly, we talk about compliance, which is probably what people think of the boring stuff, but it was actually really <laughs> interesting. It's about like the laws around it. What's malpractice? How do you think through licensing? Uh, which becomes a very big uh, thing in the U.S., especially when you have to have a different license for each state that you might practice in. Uh, and then how do you avoid fraud? Because unfortunately, it seems that this ends up happening to quite uh, more people than you would think. And so how do you avoid doing that? Yeah. So those are the five big buckets that we look in. Uh, okay. And then we try to take in small subsets in each of those. Very complete. Um, thank you for sharing. So you have more than a decade of experience now in telemedicine, you know, in this field, and also, as you said, in digital health. No? So 
what is your view? Uh, how have you witnessed the evolution of telemedicine? So in the beginning, uh, you know, very few people wanted to do it. They actually, most people didn't know what it was, right? So despite the fact that I worked for a direct-to-consumer type of telemedicine, what people think of telemedicine, you know, acute care, you call your doctor, you get like an immediate response. Uh, you know, telemedicine has been a lot around a lot longer for provider-to-provider -provider networks to connect specialists to hospitals, but people don't really know about that, right? That's not something you would know unless you were in one of those hospitals doing it. And so, you know, when it, since then, obviously, we would try to grow it out. We did see laws change earlier than the pandemic, actually. Uh, CMS, specifically in the U.S., was actually quite committed to expanding it for certain populations in the U.S. But really what they were doing is just trying to figure out how do we make sure that people have access to care. And then they didn't really reimburse for it nearly as um, standardized as they do now. Of course, the pandemic changed everything. We had everything that was built forward, um, the laws, the uh, reimbursement models, some of the ideas about the regulations. But I have to say that some of those ideas came pre-pandemic. I'll give you an example. So in the emergency medicine, we have a law called EMTALA in the US, which basically states that in the emergency room, anybody who comes, th that comes through the emergency room has to be seen and cleared of any emergencies. It's a federal law, and so we're the, basically the only place that has to see any patient that comes through. Now, for telemedicine, when we were talking about starting our teletriage project in 2017, we didn't know whether having someone seen remotely would count and fulfill EMTALA if they were coming into the emergency room. And so we went to the government and we asked them, and they didn't actually give us an answer. They said, well, you can try it, and then if it uh, someone comes forward asking us about it or complaining about it, then we'll investigate. So we decided not to risk it. But then fast forward to the pandemic, because this had happened and you know people were talking about it and we had gone to lobby, actually that law came through and they said that yes, it actually will count. But if we hadn't had that conversation before, it wouldn't have probably been as easy further along. So you know some of these changes you see are actually stepwise. And then aside from the pandemic, changing laws and regulation and just people's awareness is probably the biggest part of it because now people know to use it because it doesn't matter if people offer telemedicine if no patients are going to use it or know it exists. And now that they know about it, now there's more hybrid models. There's more patients wanting to use it. And then since then, I think more, more um, recently is the thought that you know now that telemedicine is out there and people are using it and thinking through what else do we add to it to actually make a comprehensive home healthcare service? So do we add medical devices? What kind of uh, things can we do from the home aside from that? This growth of RPM of a hospital at home, really the basis of that is telemedicine, right? Because you need to connect with those people in those spaces. And then when you look at really the, the way that we're using AI right now in medicine, a lot of that is for and helping for telemedicine. Not all of it, right? So there's going to be the charting, there's going to be the ambient AI, which can be done anywhere. However, that uh, does add to the telemedicine. And one important one is like using for chat telehealth is those chat algorithms that are using a lot of AI for that. So I'm seeing that like it's like a stepwise process that we've gone through to be able to set up a base for what we can use in the future. Right. And uh, OK, we spoke about AI, but what are some of the most significant technologies advancements in this particular field of telemedicine? No? Is there something else about AI that you want to mention? Not specifically AI, but I will say that and it will tie into AI. But I think the first thing that ha is happening is actually being able to gather data from other parts of a patient journey. Considering that, you know, we only see uh, people in the hospital or clinics, that's not really where most of their health comes, right? Their health is like all the time. So we're sitting here, we're, we're creating health data all the time. And so we have all these new devices, we have our phones, we have all these various gadgets that are now collecting that data. So that's one thing. So even if you're not using it for actual RPM, or you're not enrolled in a program where your doctor is looking at that, we're still gathering that data. So now we have that and we're moving that forward. Um, and most of the RPM programs have like an, a telemedicine component, right? Because you want to be able to intervene when something happens. Second, though, if you look at what AI is going to be doing, it's I mean, the data has to come from somewhere. So that health data isn't going to be just from hospital data anymore. It's going to be for this. And so when we take that and we be able to take that data from everybody who's uh, using this or is able to supply their data, we can take it from uh, home 
any type of situation. I'm not, we're not going to say just a home. It could be any situation and be able to do better individual care, but also population health care in the future. Like I always think through, right? So now, you know, um, I mean, I live in Paris now, but the U.S. is geographically huge. So when we're in medical school, we'll learn about certain diseases, infectious diseases that really are only in certain parts of the country. So I went to med school in Chicago, right? And there's certain diseases that are only in the southwest of the country. And so it'll be a test question. Okay, well, this person traveled here. So what are the risks? We want to know that. Absolutely. But I think that if you look at the data, we might find that there are even more specific types of outbreaks and types of diseases that happen that are actually probably even even smaller communities. And now we'll be able to gather that data in the future and be able to actually intervene and look through what might actually change both for individuals again in a, at a population. Yes, amazing, amazing. And regarding the doctors, no? so what are the main challenges uh, the healthcare provider, not only the doctors, in fact, uh, what challenges do they face when adopting this uh, telemedicine, um, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, care? No? Um, how does your book uh, help them and the course also we made together address these challenges? So, so a couple of ways. So one thing to state is that you have to have the clinician experience and how they actually practice medicine or practice care, because there's going to be nurses and physical therapists and uh, other types of coaches that also use telemedicine. But you have to actually understand their clinical process. Otherwise, it, it doesn't matter what you do. Nobody's going to want to use it or they're not going to be able to use it effectively. And so really understanding and doing the research behind that is really helpful and getting the clinician voice in there. Um, it happens often, but I'll tell you, nothing is more irritating than when people tell us how to practice without having any experience and having, having to practice. It's, it's not very helpful. And then second is really just recognizing in the individual space is that we are, we are uh, always, always learning, right? This is why CMEs exist and this continuing education. And so it's also true for telemedicine. And what I found interesting about this is that once, most of the time, once we finish residency, we will be continually trained in certain things. We'll have to upskill up if something new happens. Uh, an example in emergency medicine was, uh, so ultrasound is fairly new within the last 15, 20 years or being part of residency. I got trained in it, but some of my attendings when I was uh, training had not been, so they had to upskill. Now telemedicine is interesting because at least from when I was in attending, no one had really trained in it. So we were actually building it at the time. And so I had to train my colleagues the same I had to train residents and train, and, and train medical students. So that's a, it's an interesting space to be in where you're doing everyone at the same time because it hasn't existed. And to do that, you have to really think through what's going to be important at each level. Uh, and so when clinicians are worried or um, thinking about how do I build telemedicine, that's one thing. It's not how do I actually do it, right? Then it's also, if I'm building a practice, what do I need to know? And the book does go through all of that, like we talked about the other pillars. But I'll say specifically is clinicians want to know how to do it effectively, but also how do they make sure that they're keeping their patients safe? Because that's what's going to also be a barrier. If they don't feel like it's safe, it's they're just not going to do it. Yeah, totally. And from the patient's uh, standpoint, no, what advice would you give individuals regarding their approach to telehealth consultations with their healthcare provider? What key factors uh, should they consider to ensure a successful virtual healthcare experience? Yes. So firstly, is just being prepared with the technology. I always tell people, make sure you're logged in, you have your account ready well before you want to use it. Um, Often you may not be prepared for it because you're not thinking about it. So there's two types, right? If you have a scheduled visit or chronic care, that's easier to do. If you're doing something acute or emergent, you're not going to necessarily be prepared for it. But I would say that if you're thinking that's something you're going to do, make sure that you have that all ready. You know, make sure that your camera works, your phone works. And if you need, ask someone for help. Yeah. I have had many patients who were much you know, elderly senior citizens. They may have done it themselves, but often they had some of their, someone in their family helping. Second is to have their questions ready, right? Because I think in this scenario, it's going to be different. This isn't a place like in a clinic where people can go out and ask another question. You know, once you leave the, the room, you're probably not gonna be able to connect again. So really prepared, making sure you ask all your questions and not to be afraid to ask your questions. So make sure that everything that you need to know, uh, you have that available for you. And then three, um, just think about your own privacy. Now clinicians have to think about privacy. It's ingrained in us, right? But when, Patients are in their own space. They don't always think about it. 
So making sure that you're in a space for a medical encounter, which means you're not driving, you're not outside, you're not in a busy restaurant. These are all places I've seen patients call me from, by the way, or they're not surrounded by their colleagues at an office, right? Make sure you're somewhere that you can actually separate and make sure that you can talk to your doctor in confidence. And then just making sure that anything that um, you're afraid of in telemedicine, just ask. So my, you know, people might say, well, how do I know I'm going to get the right information or I don't feel comfortable. It's okay to ask. We're not going to necessarily be offended, especially if you're not used to doing it. And then I would also say that find out what the right type of telemedicine is for you. Uh, you can always call. There's a number of companies you can call and have a visit and try it out. Uh, but if you don't know and you're not confident in that, you can always ask your own doctor whether they supply it and whether there is an option for you to actually see telemedicine as well. Perfect. And can you share some strategies or best practices for healthcare professionals to maintain a strong doctor-patient relationship mm -hmm. in telemedicine? Mm -hmm. So this is what we call, well, I'll, I'll put it in three portions, which is the first is just setting up your space so that you're looking at the camera, you're well lit, your patient can see you. And so that you're actually not going to be distracted. So that is also just gonna set you up first off. And so you could just setting up your space. And then second, there's things about what we call digital empathy, which means uh, just being able to empathize over any technology. Some people have called it website manner. I have to tell you, I am not a fan of that. I know I use it, but I do not like that word. I like digital empathy a lot more. But the whole idea is how do you connect and create a connection with somebody, even though you're at a distance and they're not sitting in front of you? And so there's a couple of tips that you can use. One is uh, speaking at a speaking fairly slowly, not slowly, but basically not too fast, being able to um, talk to them at a rhythm that's matching the patient. Second is being able to, for them to see your face and see your facial um, motions, how you're smiling, uh, and be able to see your shoulders and actually a lot of your hand movements. In here, I was trying to demonstrate it, you can't actually see that. So if I was gonna see a patient, I'd probably move my computer a little bit further back so that they can actually see that. Make sure, in all the things, like I said, make sure you're well lit, uh, make sure that you are in, don't have any backlight or you know you look like a horror movie character in various ways that you can do if the light's not right. Yeah. Other things is to ask questions. These are all things that you would do in person also is, you know, ask questions back, repeat what they're saying, ensure that everything that they want answered is answered. Because again, you may not be able to come back in. So it's especially relevant in telemedicine that you ensure that all of their questions are answered. Uh, and then just being able to Make them feel safe and that this telemedicine encounter is a medical encounter. This is why it's incredibly important to treat it as such, because if you create that doctor patient relationship, even on a video, then people will act as such. We have a tendency, I think now with being on camera, being on social media, being everywhere to be more in informal and um, and that's okay to some degree, but if you're going to really create the same type of relationship, you want to make sure that you're keeping it a bit more formal or at least at the level of formality that you are keeping with your patient in general as you would in person. Because I know you can, if you have a longstanding patient, you may not be as formal as you are with a first time patient. Yes, totally, totally. Thanks. In your opinion, um, what role does digital empathy, I mean, you already covered that, but do you think it really plays a role in having that successful telemedicine practice? And how can this skill uh, be cultivated? No? Absolutely, it makes a difference, right? Because one of the tenets of medicine is that it's an applied science, right? So we learn all the tenets of it, but there is that portion of it that is connecting to a human and talking to them and giving them information about their health. It can be scary. You know, there's a lot of fear that can be around especially negative health news. And so you want to, it's like a lot, it is part of like one of the beauty of medicine and practicing medicine is to be able to connect with another human and have that experience and make them feel safe to be able to talk to you. And so it is really incredibly important to cultivate that in general. So, you know, there are a couple of papers on digital empathy. We include it in the book, uh, but also just thinking and practicing and figuring out what it means for you to do that. There's a lot of tips that people do. You can watch yourself. You can have someone watch you. You can get trained. 
Um, same way like we watch medical students giving histories and physicals. You, do, you could do the same type of thing with your colleagues uh, if you're not already, if you're not in school anymore. And just take a look and see how you are reacting to other someone and you feel like you're connecting. But it's something you can practice. Now, in general, you know, if you're good at bedside manner in person, uh, empathy, it's probably going to be a little bit easier to apply it digitally. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be always easy, but it's probably easier to do it. But like we have to think about bedside manner. It takes practice and we learn tips on that. So there's no reason that digital empathy isn't going to be the same. Right, right. And in your telemedicine book and also the course on XPR, how do you address adapting physical exams um, to a remote setting? No? And what are some examples maybe uh, of techniques you teach? Sure. This is my favorite question because um, people always worried about this the most every time I would talk about it, uh, telemedicine from the beginning. And so I got very good at answering this question. And I'll say from the beginning, most of what you're trying to do with a physical exam now this is true in person also is trying to determine what are you going to do with that patient you can diagnose it if you certain things you could probably diagnose the physical exam but i'll tell you we use so many exams and tests and testing and diagnostics these days that often that may not be true i'm not saying the physical exam is not useful i'll tell you for example my lung exam is probably most useful for me in person uh, or my abdominal exam, right? So these are things that I, you know, I can tell you that are really useful for me because they give me a lot of information. Um, but I would say that, you know, so just recognizing that the first thing you're trying to do is figure out the next right step for that patient is a first thing. And then two, thinking through what is it that I can do on camera that I can probably figure out and be creative about um, on the telemedicine. So for example, you can see down someone's throat. Um, you can definitely do an eye exam. You can do some basic things. And honestly, I, we, we, we have written out the entire grouping of things that you can do on telemedicine. But I'll say that some tips are also, aside from what you can actually move the camera around, have the patient help you, have them put their camera down and basically direct them to like walk around or do whatever it is that you need them to do. Second is actually seeing if there is a family member around or someone around that can help do the exam under your guidance. So an abdominal exam is a really great example of this. I will demonstrate on myself, you know, how, how I would do it. And then I'd ask them to push under me watching how the patient is reacting to that person doing it. So it's a little bit complicated because I'm doing two things at once. One, I'm trying to watch the person doing the abdominal exam to make sure they're doing it right. And then I'm trying to look at the reaction of the patient. I will say that in general, in this example, is if it's a high risk area the patient is having pain, I will generally send them in. But if it's something low risk and the risk factors are lower, I may do a wait and see. So it really is going to depend on the entire clinical picture, but it's really trying, again, to give you the information. But it can work, um, and it's going to really depend on how well you think that exam is being done under your guidance, what you can actually see, and what the patient's risks are. But yes, there's a, a number of tips that we have. And in the future, we're going to see a lot more devices that are going to help with that. There are certainly a lot out there. The barrier, of course, is that who has those devices randomly in their house? Unless you have a chronic disease that you may need it for, you very rarely are going to keep them in your house. Yes, right. I'm sure technology will help and <laughs> in this. No? And what would you say are some common, let's say, misconceptions or concerns um, from healthcare providers about transitioning no, their practice to telemedicine and how, again, uh, in your book, they can find some advice and support? Well, I think the first thing, we talked about the exam, that was a common one. I think the first thing to recognize is that you don't have to go all telemedicine, right? So I think when we were talking about being dictated to before, the pandemic did create a time period when almost everyone had to do some version of telemedicine. And often that was the only type of medicine they were doing. No one is telling anyone to do that. So if you wanna do a hybrid, um, it's you're absolutely willing to do, it's absolutely okay to do that. You don't have to go all the way to telemedicine and only telemedicine, right? So firstly, but then two is really recognizing the benefits for patients. Now, clinicians like telemedicine, okay, I think our stats in the book were something like 55 to 60%, but patients like it a lot more. They find it convenient, uh, they find it accessible, they find it easy to use, uh, they feel like that they can access uh, care at many other times when they may not have been able to do it before, or they're getting care that they wouldn't have done otherwise. 
And so because patients like it, it's important that clinicians realize that because it's going to be important for their patients in the future. Not, you know, it's going to probably limit the patients that you can see, especially as we move forward, if you're not offering it at all. They're going to want it. Um, and there was this interesting study about how a, a number of senior citizens in the U U.S. are using a lot of these direct-to-consumer companies, meaning they're not their doctors who are offering telemedicine. It's these big companies that are doing these like visits, right? But many of them, because they wanted to use a telemedicine or it was convenient, they didn't want to tell their doctors they were using it. I mean, listen, I know that it's hard to get a visit, but this could be solved if their physicians also either offered it um, or at least they didn't, they felt safe like talking about it and saying, Hey, I need to be able to use this. So the second I'd say it's, you know, patients do want to use it. Remember that. And then lastly is that if you're talking about the quality of care, there are a number of studies that you can do quality of care. We talk about physical exam. That's just an example of part, a part of that, but really it's looking at, does it work? And is it really less care? It depends on how you use it, right? So it's not going to be appropriate for every type of clinical care, but it is appropriate for a lot of care, especially when you consider the barriers that patients may have to coming into a clinic or a hospital. Using telemedicine gets around that. And so you wanna make sure that you uh, consider that when, rather than just taking it out, excuse me, saying that it doesn't work out right. Yes, yeah, Reimbursement used to be an issue, it's less of an issue now, but I will say that too. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the world is changing in all these mm -hmm. aspects, remote, uh, hybrid, etc. So we are all learning. But mm -hmm. I, I think that's what you said, that if the people, the patients demand it, then it's important that the healthcare professional develops the skills and get the proper training to use it uh, for the patient, of course, but of course for themselves, because I believe there, there are quite also, uh, you outlined some, uh, of course, advantages for the healthcare provider also. Um, could you discuss maybe some real life case studies or examples uh, from your telemedicine uh, course uh, or, or in the book that illustrate this successful implementation of telehealth practice? Mm, sure, yeah, there's quite a few. I think one of the favorite examples that we talked about in the book is the Indian Health Services in the U.S. So they are a federal program and they take care of the Native American populations and tribal groups within the U.S. So, you know, there were a no, there's a number of barriers to that. There, the geography is vast. They may not have con connectivity and Wi-Fi. And so a lot of care at their um, services may be limited. So during, the, during uh, the pandemic, they started using telemedicine like everybody. And in one example that we talked about, they opened up a cardiologist. Instead of having to fly, basically, which takes about three flights to get them to a certain part of Alaska, they started using telemedicine. It increased their care and it saved them so much money that they were actually able to invest and start treating another disease that was very prevalent in the community. So that not only just helped with that one particular case, it actually helped the community as a whole. And that's really what you want to see, right? Now, I'm not saying it saved everything, but it def definitely did uh, show that it did benefit them, right? Certainly. Totally. And then there's, of course, these small examples, right? We have a story about um, a child with cancer and their parents had to drive two hours to get to a hospital where they would be treated. It's, you know, a children's uh, oncologist, where the children, excuse me, pediatric oncologist was. But with telemedicine, they didn't actually have to go all the time. And so the child didn't have to be pulled out of school. They didn't have to drive the and travel that far. I mean, it's taxing. And, treating tax, the cancer is already hard enough uh, without adding that to it. And they said that it really did help uh, just make it easier for them to feel, it felt, made them feel safer too, right? Because they could connect also much more easily yeah. and had that backup as well. Um, I mean, there's, there's just tons of stories like that, but I think those are the ones that come to my mind quite often. Yeah. Nice story. Thank you for sharing. And um, maybe to conclude um, this, uh, this interview, uh, what would you envision as the future trends no, um, in telemedicine and how can professionals prepare uh, mm -hmm. to adapt to these changes? I think it'll be just part of practice. And so I can't stress enough that preparing for it and assuming that you are going to do it uh, and making sure that you understand what it is and how your particular specialty will do it is going to be crucial. It hasn't gone everywhere yet. I will say this, we think so, because maybe we all live in that space and we've seen it, or maybe we've done it 
but it's not ubiquitous. There are lots of places in the world where people are not having access to telemedicine. They're not doing it uh, all over. And so there's a lot of places for it to still grow. So that's one thing we're going to see. And we're going to be able to see better home health with all of these other technologies added to it. So it's for, for clinicians in general, unless you're really planning to retire with your patient population, maybe in the next five years, you have to really learn it and consider how you're going to use it. Look at your specialty societies, look at the research in your specialty to figure out how people are doing it. There's enough out there now and then figure out how you want to incorporate it into your practice. Well, thank you for this amazing vision and all these precious tips you shared today, Aditi. Um, I have also a surprise for the people who listen till the end. This is the reward, no? <laughs> so um, if you liked what you heard, if you took the course or if you read the book or all or anything, I invite you um, to this challenge. Please uh, go to Xperia now, uh, download Xperia on your phone and search for the telehealth course by uh, Dr. Joshi. Complete it and share your certificate on social media. And the first 15 doctors to successfully complete the course and uh, share on the social media will receive for free as a giveaway. Thank you, Dr. Joshi, for that a book, okay? So the book, Telehealth Success, to deep dive into this amazing field. And thank you, Dr. Aditi, for everything you shared today. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully we see each other soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye.